Thank you for your presentation and for the invitation to this conference. Um, well, uh, yes, I, my uh, presentation is about war veterans and uh, I will just start uh, by explaining my, the background of my work, which is uh, rather than, than the First World War is veterans history. So I worked not only on First, First World War veterans, but also on veterans of other uh, conflicts. War veterans history, well, historians working on veterans uh, normally focus on these three aspects, interrelated aspects, veteran politics, so the dealings of uh, organizations, for example, uh, social aspects such as uh, disability, uh, disabled war veterans, and um, cultural aspects, so the memory of war, for example. But recently, in the last uh, years, new transnational and global perspectives are being introduced in, uh, into war veterans' history. And this means that, vet, uh, that, sorry, that historians have started um, analyzing and studying international veterans' organizations, which is the focus of my uh, paper today. Um, so veterans' history after the First World War was uh, characterized by the emergence of mass veteran politics. So the most important veterans organizations were created as a consequence of the First World War. For example, the American Legion, which still today exists, or the British Legion, all these organizations were created after the First World War. Um, and they were mass uh, organizations with uh, membership of over one million sometimes in some countries. Um, but the interwar period was marked by two very important events in the realm of veteran politics. The first was the Russian Revolution of uh, 1917. You may wonder what, what this Russian Revolution had to do with veteran politics. And just uh, I want to remind that uh, Bolshevism emerged uh, from the experience of the First World War and uh, a kind of uh, trench Bolshevism was uh, one of the uh, forces propelling the, the Russian Revolution in 1917. So the perception of the Bolshevik challenge uh, was the origin of many uh, remobilizing measures in other belligerent countries in World War I. Uh, in connection with the Russian Revolution of 1917 is also uh, the origin of fascism in, in Italy. Um, Mussolini was formerly a socialist, as you know, and the perception of the Russian Revolution led him to uh, define a new ideology, fascism, as soon as uh, late 1917, Mussolini was already writing about a new ideology uh, in which veterans will have a very important political role. So for Mussolini and the, the early fascists, veterans were conceived as uh, political actors, as nationalists and, and combatants. Um, historiography has focused on the history of veterans in the interwar period, main, mainly under the framework of the brutalization thesis of uh, historian George Mosse. We have already talked in this conference on this brutalization concept. And this debate has been uh, going on for uh, some time and it, it has reached no consensus. So um, I will come back later to that. Um, as part of these debates, um, historians have uh, become interested in but what is conceptualized as veterans internationalism. There were international veterans organizations in the interwar period, mainly two in organizations, the uh, Fédération Interallier des Anciens Combattants, uh, created in 1920, um, and the uh, CIAMAC, this is, stays for uh, uh, Conférence Internationale des Associations de Mutilés et Anciens Combattants created a bit later in 1925. So these two main international organizations have attracted uh, the attention of historians. Uh, 
um, debate of on brutalization. So as you may know, there are historians who argue that brutalization led many veterans to join fascist movements or the Nazi party, etc. Other historians have said the contrary, that uh, the war experience did not brutalize uh, veterans or the men in the trenches, but made them pacifists and internationalists and people who rejected violence. Um, so the examples of international veterans organizations are understood as a proof of the internationalist and pacifist feelings of veterans. So, so somehow there is a uh, opposition between brutalization on the one hand and internationalism and pacifism on the other hand. So historians have been debating, well, what is was more important, uh, the groups of internationalist and pacifist veterans or the nationalist and fascist brutal veterans in the interwar period. This is the uh, main uh, book published on the topic so far, on the topic of uh, veterans internationalism, edited by Julia Eichenberg and John von Neumann, and it collects contributions on uh, different national examples of uh, participation of veterans in international organizations. Well, the um, overall interpretation of these historians uh, in this volume and other historians such as Antoine Pro um, is that this uh, participation of veterans in international organizations uh, which uh, they have these international organizations have the main purpose of promoting peace so they argue that this is the main, the main proof of the uh, let's say, positive uh, effects of the war experience. They argue that veterans, as they have experienced war and terrible, terrible things, the confrontation with death, etc., et became pacifists and uh, people prone to find an understanding with uh, former enemies and uh, other nations. Well, stretching this argument, for example, Antoine Po wrote in 2013 that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 is the ultimate victory of citizen soldiers. And um, some historians also uh, argue that veterans can be understood as, uh, let's say, ambassadors of goodwill or uh, as the best uh, speakers for peace. In my view, however, this is not the uh, best way of understanding international veterans organizations and international activism. There is an overall uh, opposition also between the concept of cultures of victory and cultures of defeat. So according to these historians, uh, in Germany or Italy, veterans will have developed cultures of defeat that led them to join nationalist and fascist movements. Whereas in countries such as France, uh, their veterans developed uh, cultures of victory that in the end were transformed into um, cultures of reconciliation. This really, well, in my view, it doesn't work. Uh, for, there are many reasons, there are many caveats to this uh, over-interpretation. One, one is the fact that it is based on a beyond history as uh, a juxtaposition of national histories for what happened in Germany did not happen in France, etc. Um, and other uh, reason is that, for example, in the case of Italy, what was uh, the predominant war culture? It was, was it a culture of victory because Italy had won the First World War or was it a culture of defeat because veterans joined in substantial numbers fascist movements? So there are many caveats on this, in these uh, debates on culture of, cultures of defeat and victory, brutalization and internationalism. So in my view, this, this concept, this, this uh, uh, conceptualization is an artificial uh, polarization that does not reflect 
uh, historical complexity. And also, very important, brutalization, this interpretation, does not explain the relationship between veterans and fascism, which was much more uh, complex and convoluted. This uh, opposition between brutalization and pacifism uh, leads to repeat meta-narratives about the role of veterans and about the veteran identity. Uh, they, as I mentioned, uh, these meta-narratives implied seeing border crossing veterans as ambassadors of goodwill who want to meet their uh, comrades from other countries and together find an international understanding. And well, uh, after the Second World War, these narratives persisted. This is a um, sentence by a Peace Nobel Prize, Ralph Banshee. No one can speak more eloquently for peace than those who have fought in war. So as veterans have known the horrors of war, they are entitled to tell the rest of society that uh, how they should attain peace. And this, this sentence was taken as the motto of international veterans organizations after the Second World War. However, if you go to the sources of the interwar, interwar period, this is um, the Völkische Beobachter, uh, the uh, journal, as you may know, of the Nazi party. You can see that yeah, Nazi veterans also participated in international veterans organizations and they also presented veterans as the uh, guarantors of peace. This is a sentence by Hermann Göring, the alten Frontkämpfer sind die besten Friedensträger. Uh, this same st sentence was used uh, in several occasions by other Nazis, also, also Rudolf Hess, I think Hitler uh, himself, and also Italian fascists. So the same mythos of veterans as the best uh, pacifists uh, was present both in ultranationalist and bellicist uh, movements and also on left-wing veterans movements. So um, I, in my research, in my research, I uh, problematized this this debate and applied different uh, concepts and uh, different kind. Of, of analysis transcending the brutalization debate. This is what I mainly did in my latest book, uh, War Veterans and Fascism in Interwar Europe. And uh, basically, um, I, I will summarize here. I analyze international veteran politics during the interwar period as a process marked by symbolic and organizational struggles, by processes of fascistization of veteran politics and the transnationalization of fascism. And I distinguish uh, different trends of internationalism. Uh, in particular, I distinguish four shades of veterans internationalism in the interwar period. So it is not that I identify internationalism with pacifism, but that there were different forms of this uh, activity. Mm. So the four versions of veterans internationalism that I, I identify, first, uh, there was a communist internationalism. Well, communist, uh, first, a socialist internationalism that de uh, developed, uh, embracing uh, communism later. This is the first real uh, ideological uh, internationalist trend among veterans after the First World War. And it uh, emerged from the Russian Revolution. The example of Henri Barbus is the, the most important. Uh, you know, he was a French writer and later he, he was a Republican and a, a, a pacifist author of uh, the famous book Le Feu, and he was uh, one of the founders of uh, a socialist and later communist French veterans organization, the ARAC, and he already 
in October 1919, created with other veterans from um, Germany, a Veterans International. Um, against this, this is Henri Barbus, against this project, um, conservative veterans, mainly from, from France, but in connection with conservative British veterans, um, there was another project of an international veterans organization, which was the FIDAC, created in, during 1920. Uh, this was, uh, yes, I think it was yesterday, another presentation talked about the FIDAC and the Memorial uh, Integralier, and this presentation showed that, no, actually, the FIDAC was not really promoting peace. They, this FIDAC represented the, the wartime alliance between uh, the allies of the First World War. So this organization did not accept veterans from Germany, for example, or, or defeated countries. So this FIDAC represented another kind of veterans internationalism, a conservative and I will say nationalist version of internationalism. Uh, in my uh, case study, I, I focus on uh, Henri Pichot, who was the French leader of the uh, Union Federale, a veterans association. He was also participating in the other third version of veterans internationalism, which was SIAMAC. This other organization was created in 1925, and it was much more clearly connected to the uh, League of Nations. Um, it took longer to, to, to consolidate uh, because mainly the main veterans organizations in the, in the different countries had acquired a very conservative and nationalist profile. So CMAC took longer um, to, to develop and had a more limited uh, range of activities. René Cassin, a French, famous French jurist and later uh, Peace Nobel Prize, was the main figure behind the CIAMAC and this liberal internationalism. This is uh, René Cassin and uh, one, a recent book that was published about him as one of the promoters of uh, human rights. So three, so far, versions of, vet of veterans internationalism in the interwar period. There was a fourth version of veterans internationalism, which was fascism internationalism. Um, fascist movements, as I mentioned, manipulated the symbol of the veteran and uh, based substantially on this symbol of the veteran, their expansion throughout Europe and their transnational connections. Um, I cannot go into many details here, I refer to uh, bibliography, but um, I want just to show the example of uh, Carlo del Croix, who was uh, an Italian a nationalist veteran who became, uh, he was a disabled veteran, who became a um, member of the Nazi party in 1923 and uh, this is uh, Carlo del Croix. Here, is, this is in a meeting uh, with other, uh, with French veterans in Paris. Uh, he doesn't look very fascist here, but uh, in this other picture, he's on the left. Uh, this is in, in the late 30s. This is a meeting with the, uh, another leader of the uh, the leader of the National Socialist, one of the National Socialist Veterans Organizations. These uh, veterans, uh, fascist veterans, managed to monopolize um, veteran politics in the interwar period. And um, to conclude, what I want to stress is that we can only understand all this historical process if we transcend the debate on brutalization, if we conceptualize war veterans not at, as internationalists, but as transnational actors, which is a more neutral analytical concept, and just uh, uh, remind that at least 
four versions of veterans' internationalism can be identified in the interwar period. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention.